as president of a peripheral college, it would seem awkward for me to chair a meeting on commercialization of higher education. In fact, I thought that it was particularly interesting that the main theme, the caption of the meeting, is privatization in higher education rather than privatization of higher education. There is a lot of difference between these two words, and I feel very comfortable about privatization in higher education. As uh, Professor uh, Reichman told you uh, some 20 years ago, 21 years ago, uh, I, I was the proponent of Ramot Mishpat, hoping, hoping to proceed then with Ramot uh, Nihul and Ramot Cheshbonaut and so on and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, although uh, Professor Reichman made a big success of Ramot Mishpat, my successor as president, Professor Dinstein, although enjoying very much the bonuses of Ramot Mishpat, did not take him six months in order to do the whole thing in. And this is why uh, I'm happy that uh, Uriel took the challenge and was very successful. And I'm very proud to have been part of it, this initiative, at least in the beginning, I still feel very honored to sit on the board of the Interdisciplinary Center. Insofar as the subject matter for this panel is concerned, I happen to be a doctor too, a physician, and I see a lot of parallelism between the system of higher education and the health services here. Just how much privatization should be allowed in health services, and I think that the same dosage should be looked at also in higher education. And now, without further ado, I would like to call upon Professor Motzkin, who heads the Van Leer Institute, to present his case. Thank you. If there's a, is this, oh, this just took not for me. All right, I have a lecture that I'm going to read. We need to define two things. What do we mean by the challenge of commercialization? And what is meant by the expression non-commercial value in higher education? Basically, my thesis is that unless we find some way to quantify non-commercial value in higher education, we will succumb to commercialization. What is the challenge of commercialization? Commercialization can be deemed to have begun with the development of private colleges in the United States in the 19th century. A further stage was marked by the development of programs in questionably academic fields such as business. However, in the age of the internet, commercialization means the presence of educational vendors who are not universities and who are willing to sell their educational product via means such as the internet. Thus, in the first stage, commercialization meant the development of private institutions of higher learning, such as the IDC in Herzliya. The second stage is marked by the academization of previously non-academic fields of endeavor. The third stage is one in which the primacy of colleges and universities in awarding qualifications is subverted. We have not yet reached that stage, but it is entirely imaginable. There is a parallel process in the other function of higher education, research. Thus, in the first stage, research is outsourced to research institutions that do not engage in teaching. This phenomenon began in Germany in the late 19th century and in France with the French Revolution. The novelty was actually the 19th century integration of teaching and research, which may turn out to be temporary. In the second stage, academization expands to fill all imaginable areas of life. For example, research institutes engage in activity that was not previously considered to be academic, such as policy studies. Nobody even questions the academization of policy studies in contemporary culture, but no institution before World War II 
was of this type. Some policy institutes are within universities and some are not. Perhaps archetypical for this process is the RAND Corporation, which started as a private contractor, but at one point began to award doctoral degrees without becoming an institution of higher learning. In a conceivable third stage, most research will no longer be carried out within universities, since it will have become too expensive and will be carried out by private corporations. However, the example of the RAND Corporation may indicate that firms such as GE or Siemens may then evolve to award quasi-academic or academic degrees. The contemporary blurring of the boundary between university and business has been masked by the creation of large integrated university com business communities such as Route 128 and Silicon Valley. The idea was that location next to a university could provide economies of knowledge transfer for venture enterprises. This intuition is only true so long as either venture capital or knowledge capital is relatively cheap. If such commodities turn out to be more expensive than separate corporate research departments, then they will fade. <coughs> Thus the question is whether the advantages of knowledge concentration will outweigh the disadvantages called occasion by the sharply increasing costs of contemporary research. The commercialization of research means either that research will cease to be done in universities or universities will evolve into some quasi-commercial institutions. Thus, the future holds two options. Either universities will disappear or they will not look anything like universities do today. In the context of commercialization, maintaining non-commercial universities may be just too expensive. Lest one have any illusions, this development is as potentially threatening for the sciences as it is for the humanities. Right now, the situation is one in which undergraduate research, uh, undergraduate education is combined with research. In the humanities, the problem is that graduate research cannot readily be commercialized, and so the humanities are devalued into a form of undergraduate education. However, the sciences depend on the labor of graduate students in order to run their labs economically. Despite their comparatively large incomes in relation to other students in terms of what they do, graduate students in the sciences are grossly underpaid. They subsidize the university in its guise as a private corporation. This anomaly is unlikely to subsist. At some point, it will be comparatively advantageous for science graduate students to obtain real wages in the private sector, i.e., once the link between graduate study and accreditation is dissolved, or once businesses will award certifications or degrees, some things they don't do today because of the restriction on certifying institutions that is characteristic of today's states, but that may well also fade. It could, however, be that in the future, a state will be able to choose to accredit on the basis, accredit scientists on the basis of five published papers just like now, with the difference that they will have written them while being well paid by a private corporation. What then could the future be like? It may consist of a two or three year general education program followed by a return to a kind of on-the-job training. However, this corporatization of study and training may be damaging for the quality of the research done, since research will be devalued into being a trade. Being a researcher will be much like getting a law degree while working for a lawyer, the way that most American lawyers qualified in the 19th century. The situation in the recent past, when governments subsidized nonprofit research at universities, cannot continue on anything like the same scale because the rate of increase of the expense of educational institutions in the tertiary, i.e. higher education sector, has far outstripped the rate of inflation. Indeed, the relative amount spent on research in universities in many countries as a proportion of GDP is declining. Moreover, nonprofit research is also being contaminated by the drive to democratization, i.e. spreading the limited money between too many institutions. This can readily be seen in the allocation of research funds in the EU, which in terms of the money spent has failed to produce the expected quality of research. This outcome must be due in part to the EU selection process, 
in a confrontation between nonprofit research and research for profit. Research for profit holds an excellent hand in barring major international convulsions may likely obtain the upper hand. The point I wish to take up now is the question of what is meant by the idea that privatization may damage the quality of the research done. On the one hand, such an idea is counterintuitive, since in an open situation, one could assume that the best research will triumph. The problem is that the best science from an economic point of view is not always the best science from some other point of view. What that other point of view may be is a matter for clarification. One parameter would be the best science per se. For example, the exact accusation has been made that cancer research has stagnated because of drug company funding, since it is alleged that drug companies are not interested in innovations that would threaten existing products. Another parameter might be research that is socially beneficial but economically damaging. This possibility is masked by the notion that anything can be rendered profitable. However, there may be a large time gap between the social need to carry out research and the point in time at which it would become profitable. One could imagine other criteria for what might constitute the best science. Scientific rationality is not quite the same as economic rationality. What we mean by non-economic rationality, however, may have other or different components than scientific rationality. If we agree that economic rationality is only one kind of rationality, it follows that economic optimization is only one parameter for designing an optimal research and education system. It also implies that if we apply economic measures to non-economic activities, we may obtain absurd results. Anyone who has studied costs in higher education knows that cost measures in higher education are notional and that profit or outcome measures are even more far-fetched. That raises the question of what non-economic parameters can be applied in a precise fashion and what might such non-economic parameters be. As noted, it is easy to invent criteria that appear to be analogous to economic criteria. Such criteria don't work because they are only apparently economic. What I am arguing is not only what they measure may not be amenable to economic measurement, but also that these criteria, for example, those of the allocation model used by the Planning and Budgeting Committee of the Council of Higher Education, are not even truly economic criteria. This argument is analogous to arguing that if we apply economic e criteria, e.g., to measuring God's presence in the world, the criteria will not really be economic ones. Not only because God's presence in the world is not amenable to economic measurement, but because the model we construct for this purpose will be fantastic. Cost, output, and profit will themselves not look like cost, output, and profit when these measures are applied to business activity. One problem with such measures is the question of defining the market for higher education activity. In a free market situation, universities would be able to raise funds in relation to their fabrication of a better product. But in certain ways, the market for higher education is not really a free market. One well-known facet of the higher education market is that it is really an oligopolistic guild. Still, that of itself would not fully prevent market behavior, as e.g. the case of the Guild of Lawyers shows. In the Israeli situation, there is a graver distortion in that most of the money comes from one source, i.e. that Israeli universities confront a situation where, in which there is a monopoly of supply. In such a situation, the supplier can jack up the price to any level he or she wants. If only one place in the world produces oil, the owners of that place can set any price they want. But what is the good that is owned by the monopolistic supplier here? It is money itself. Therefore, the cost of money for universities, dependent on the PBC, can be seen to be very high. If one could quantify this cost of money, its rate might even turn out to be usurious. The assumption here is that when you receive money from government, it is an illusion to think that its cost is nothing, that the money is free. Rather, it is very high. Such costs as the cost of money for a publicly funded institution 
should be amenable to quantification. The irrationality of the cost of money in a non-market situation imposes monopolistic distortions on the economics of education. These distortions are cumulative rather than constant. It is not as if a constant percentage of distortion will create a constant deviation from the optimum. It, rather, a cost-based financing system will create ever greater inefficiencies both in research and in teaching as the experience of health and medicine and medicine ra ra readily proves in the United States. Moreover, while expensive health care may be better care, the marginal benefit of ever greater money lavished on the health care system must be seen to lead to an ever smaller result because of the slope of the effect of monetary investment is ever flatter. What that means is that if one is buying luxury goods, one pays a lot of money for a negligible result in quality. Moreover, at some point, this curve can reverse direction. Thus, very expensive clothes are often much less durable than slightly less expensive clothes because they are intended to have a one-time effect. In the same way, cost-based financing provides incentives to the recipient to jack up notional, notional costs in order to get more money, and the recipient can only do so after a given point by becoming less efficient. No matter how that criterion is defined, cost-based financing will eventually result in reduced efficiency. Here then, the real question has to be, what are the qualities one wants to have in a product? Should, for example, durability be a measure for quality in clothing? Here it should be pointed out that even if one somehow selects a given quality for preference, such as creativity, the way from investment to output is not a straight path. Implementation often has to be conceived in terms of arranging for byproducts and spillover effects where the desired goal is precisely the spillover effect and not the stated goal. That means, for this example, that intellectual creativity is often a result of the kind of work in which one is engaged, that simply rewarding the best scholars is not a guarantee of creativity. That last statement needs to be tested over time in various disciplines in order to figure out whether the overall uh, quality of work in a given uh, discipline has been increasing or declining over time. Stated another way, what this means is that because something expense is expensive does not mean that it is valuable. It may not even be economically valuable. We treat health as if the goods supplied in the health market were like paintings at an art auction. The price of the painting is the same as the cost, which is notional. The original cost of producing the painting has no effect on the price of the painting at all. I believe that the cost of much of what goes on in the health profession is also notional, but it is notional in a slightly different way. The people in the health profession claim that there exists a relationship between the cost of health and its price. In that case, why does the health price for health services vary so much across the world, even when we factor in purchasing power parities? When an educational granting organization applies the parameter of cost for spending, comparatively scarce educational monies, that means that it is treating groups such as the members of the health profession as if they consist of collections of potentially valuable artists. The point about the price of artworks is that the only ceiling they have is the purchasing power of the richest agent who is interested in purchasing the picture. In other words, there is no ceiling on notional costs other than the disposable wealth or the preferences of the members of the society in question. When this criterion is applied to collective costs, the same principle holds. As the example of health expenditure in the United States shows, American society can still spend much more than it does on health. Moreover, it is not clear that American society has reached the point at which it has to cut other expenditures in order to meet its health costs. At most, it has to cut the growth in other expenditures in order to meet the growth in health costs. From this discussion, it can be inferred that such costs can only continue to grow as long as there is no external limit set by the spender, in this case, a society or its government. Moreover, at some point, they will work like bad money driving out good money, i.e. they will cause noise at the margin in the competition between the costs in different sectors for society's absolutely disposable funds. Thus, there is no relation between the costs of such goods and their value. One could, of course, argue that the cost of a good is its value, 
My point here is that what has happened is that the price is indeed set in terms of the cost, but the cost is an arbitrary figure. In this case, there is no way to tell the value of the good since the price has been distorted and since the cost is arbitrary. Thus, neither the cost nor the price is a reliable indicator for the value of the good. It is a good question whether this situation would also true, hold true in an absolutely free market, one in which it could be presupposed that the price would reflect a minimum margin beyond the cost, and the cost itself would be subject to competition, i.e., that the cost itself would be held at a minimum. However, this model does not work for two reasons. The first is a general argument that I will not develop, namely that perfectly free markets are somehow inherently distorted because such free markets uh, would, can only work if the prices of the goods uh, could be, are held constant. However, innovation distorts equilibrium. Also, free markets inherently advantage certain types of cost factors in relation to others, thus making some goods more preferable in, uh, to others in a way that could not be directly deduced from the freedom of the market itself. The second reason is that the impetus in such a market is to cut costs to the bone. However, that cost cutting means that the good that is being offered for sale is no longer the same good. A three-wheeled vehicle, cheaper to make, is not the same as a four-wheeled vehicle, and a cheap medical education is perceived to be in some way different from an expensive medical education. In these cases, the operation of the free market has changed the good through reassessing its value. But what alternative model can be advanced? In the absence of cost and of price, how can one obtain a coherent way of measuring value? We have shown that one cannot compute the value of a good that is subject to such a criterion as notional cost, since the value is induced from the cost and not from the price. Since in the case of e.g. medical education, the price is less than the cost. The question, however, to be addressed is what would be the situation if one could design a model in which the cost would be dependent on the value. Perhaps the great advantage of non-economic goods is that in their case, value can be set as dictating cost. However, simply declaring value as the independent variable does not mean that one is any closer to having a criterion for defining or measuring value, let alone comparative value, a measure that, like money, allows one to use the same measure of value for different non-economic goods. Moreover, even if one had such a criteria, perhaps the same problem that we discerned in the case of rare art or medical education would hold for the non-economic criterion of value. Namely, the criterion would work best for goods clustered around the median and would be totally ineffective for the outliers. The problem we face that in certain cases is that however we are interested in the outliers, and by definition, these are not really amenable to measurement in the same way that the measure of IQ is less precise the further one out is on the scale from the medium. Yet in some cases, forms of education, what we are seeking to reward or find is genius. By definition, we could only do so if we could devise a measure that would let us distinguish between different levels of genius. At some point, refining these distinctions would become imprecise because the end would be too small. So even if case one of genius were twice as good as case two of genius in a two-person field, even in that case. The underlying argument here is that some types of economic education, of academic education, are treated as if they were rare goods, diamonds. We have seen the market distortions that diamonds inherently create. However, having diamonds on one end of the scale for rare gems creates still another distortion, namely treating non-preferred goods as if they were junk, zircons. Medicine is not a diamond, and Sumerian is not a zircon. Thus, we have reached the following professional, provisional conclusion. In some significant ways, the analysis of non-economic value does behave like the analysis of economic value. Is this a consequence of our rationality or a consequence of the process of valuation? However, in some significant ways, non-economic value does not depend like, behave like economic value. The one way that we have found where this is true is that the criteria for non-economic value must precede valuation, but we still don't know what they are. We either apply economic criteria to non-economic values, and then we obtain irrational results, or we invent measures that are both values and valuations. Constructive outputs that are apparently quantitative, such as number of publications requisite for promotion. 
This example shows what the problem is. Lib service is paid, paid to the idea that someone can be promoted on the basis of a few significant publications. This does happen. I had one case. But very rarely. What is then our standard for evaluating those few publications? The letters of evaluation obtained from experts. In other words, what we really do is we substitute peer review from the market and then assume that peer review and the market are rational in the same way. Of course, this result cannot be true since peer review is by definition an oligopoly, while a few rational market cannot be an oligopoly. This example shows how imposing a certain measure on the market of itself distorts the market in question. Moreover, in this particular market, demand is valued more than supply, i.e. peer estimation as a measure of demand for the product of an individual scholar is viewed as more important than the sheer number of publications. Three pages. In certain situations, however, a rational market would say that sometimes supply is more of a factor than demand. Too. And in other situations, the reverse applies. Moreover, one suggestion, this measure shows that we are all conceiving of the academic market as one in which the goal is to produce an intellectual Rolls Royce. However, such a market is really one in which we believe that there is a Rolls Royce that is hidden somewhere in a pile of Volkswagens. It is obvious that such a procedure is very expensive and is much like a treasure hunt for the one stone that will produce a big payoff. However, just as almost all prospectors never find the Hope Diamond, in this analogy, the cost of trying to discover the Rolls Royce far exceeds any conceivable profit. Remember, we pay out the same for producing a genius mathematician and a very good but not outstanding mathematician. In other words, our method of valuation has transformed what we conceive of to be a market into a treasure hunt. Yet when, in contrast to the system of hire for hiring, we turn to the educational system through which we produce researchers, we impose other opposite measures. We bewail the desire of students to study so-called practical subjects. We say, oh, that's so bad. We bewail the little demand, unlike in our intellectual evaluation, and we want to force feed them to whatever education we imagine may be good for them, i.e. we extol supply. In other words, there is no measure for equilibrium in the nonprofit system. The pursuit of excellence and the production of excellence operate according to opposite principles. Moreover, the consequences of our strategy for assessing demand as a basis for hiring and promotion assigns wildly varying marginal values to phenomena where the underlying difference in real marginal value is relatively small, while the consequence of our strategy for assessing supply as a basic criteria for what we teach people is actually a reduction in the diversity of offering. I repeat, the consequence of our educational system has been a reduction in our intellectual offering to students and an overemphasis on presumed differences between the academics and intellectuals who were created by the homogeneous system we have created. An educational system that is both homogeneous and highly selective may produce a cohesive elite, but it is questionable whether it can produce the very originality it claims to further. If such systems, such as like the French educational system, can be nevertheless shown to stimulate outstanding work at the margins, the reason my le must lie elsewhere and not in the system. Where else? Alas, my answer to this question will not be particularly revolutionary, but I think that the consequence of the application of social science methods to the educational system has been the neglect of the question of what is taught. The real difference in values between subjects must, must be, unfortunately, related to their content. Moreover, it is not clear that comparative commodity indifference curve can be meaningly cons meaningfully constructed as if X mathematics is worth Y Bible. Yet what we actually do is to assign X hours of teaching to A and Y to B. Moreover, we assume for reasons of convenience that fields are worth X credit points as if French and philosophy are comparable in the quantity of knowledge that is to be taught. Even where we draw a difference in assigning, e.g. in assigning more credit hours to the sciences than to the humanities, we do not do so for any well-thought judgment about the matter taught. This point may sound bad banal, but it consists of a hot potato, for it's, what it says is that literature may be more important than physics, or biology may be more important than philosophy, that there are inherent differences in the matter of what is studied, and some of these differences may of themselves foster or impede excellence. Moreover, we rarely consider the spillover effects from teaching one discipline to another. These spillover effects may be such 
that a field may itself not be so excellent, but may nonetheless be requisite to producing excellence in a quite different field, e.g. philosophy as a prerequisite for producing innovative physics. This question of cross-disciplinary effects has not obtained sufficient empirical study. But this kind of value is non-commercial value. Moreover, it is value that can be quantified in relation to outputs. My thesis, while by definition non-commercial value cannot be studied as if it were a free market, that does not mean that it cannot be measured or quantified. However, that does, does not mean that the appropriate model is some kind of input-output analysis that analyzes all components in terms of a small set of factors. Rather, non-commercial value can be inherently evaluated in the interrelation between fields. This is not a suggestion for it being interdisciplinary. It is rather to measure the effects of one discipline in another discipline. If we wish to measure the general culture or social effects of the phenomenon, it makes sense to measure the palpable effects on the immediate surroundings, although not all effects behave this way. My reason for this suggestion is that there is an inherent barrier in any field to import conclusions for some other discipline. Often these extra discipline conclusions are, are only symbolic, for it is often the case that people reinterpret extra disciplinary discipline in terms of their academic discourse. Nonetheless, the consequences of such a move could be great, but would be a play, place a premium in our policy on appealing to an academic audience outside of one's own discipline. Moreover, it would be interesting to be able to determine what apparently unrelated knowledge is synergistic for specific fields. Thank you. Now call upon my colleague, Professor Eliezer Shalev, of, Professor of Gynecology at the Technion, to present a private program with a, within a public system. Thank you. Uh, usually I'm speaking in front of physicians, and I was, I was wondering what would be the difference. And I noted that uh, when a lecturer is missing, uh, he's ill. In our uh, a meeting when a lecturer is missing is treating an urgent situation in his department, and that's the main difference, main excuse. Uh, okay, this title that was taken from the Chronicle in 2002 uh, mentioned the problem of uh, fall of the flagships, and uh, I don't know if the name is correct, but the topic is still uh, in question, and the proof is the two days that uh, you are spending here. I was asked uh, to speak about our hybrid solution to the problem, uh, designing a private program within a medical uh, faculty, and since we are speaking about uh, medicine, uh, we will have to tackle the problem of education in uh, medicine. And it's not a secret, particularly in this room, that uh, the governmental uh, support for higher education is uh, pr progressively declined during the last two decades. And the immediate instinctive response by the universities was limited. This limitation resource have led universities to subsidize full-time channel track faculty members with part-time or non channel track faculty members. This has been implemented despite the knowledge that the increase in the part-time faculty members or non channel track employee will be associated with the reduction in the percentage of student graduate rates, and that's what happened in the United States. Medical education has been abused three times. Not only has the governmental financial support reduced and the health care budget was restricted, the medical cost edu uh, education progressively increased. Again, the instinct outcome was cutting of staff position, consolidation overlapping positions, unifying technical units, merging, and in extreme situation, even eliminating programs. 
Now, if you want really to decrease expense and cost, then you have to shorten and to slice and to chop the medical curriculum. And if you will do that, you will leave the increasing medical knowledge and the information and skills that you expect from your future physicians, which is increasing all the time, to rock on this edge and then naturally to fall down. Now, the cost of obtaining medical education can be, especially medical uh, in Israel and abroad as well, can be uh, divided into two types. The instruction cost, which is directly related to the teaching, and the total education cost that take into account the scholarships, grants, patient care, etc., and, and you should double the numbers that you see in this slide. So the average instructional course in the States is between 40,000 to 50,000. Those are the numbers from 2003, 2004. Now the average fees for students in a public university in the state was at that time $60,000, which is third of the instructional cost. The corresponding figures in the private institute mentioned here is 32,500, uh, and in some of them it's even 50% higher than this rate. Now in Israel, the estimated direct instruction cost is about 25,000 American dollars, where here the tuition, and you have heard it three days ago, is about, and it depends which day you are asking, is about $2,500. Extent of the instructional cost of a medical student. Now, with the increased cost, of course, tuition has become an opportunity to close the gap between the budget and the expenses. And universities in the States have opted for raising and using valuable pricing models, and you hear about the vouchers, etc., for the student tuition. And that's single uh, uh, slide show you the prices in a private institute of one student, 40,000 for fees, and then you reach the 60,000 year. However, you should remember, and those of you who are coming from the States, in the States there is a loan federal loan and state loans that the students uh, can have and which we don't have here, unfortunately. And we have heard about this solution. Mortgaging our future. That was the title in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2005. And you just have to see the rise in uh, special education debt of private school, public schools, tuition, in relation to the consumer price index. And you see the difference in the shape and the slope of those points. Not only in the States, in other Western countries, like in Canada, for example, you see the rise in the tuition, which goes, of course, when the government support is going down. Now, this extreme act of increasing tuition in the United States and other countries has violently compromised social values and duties of higher education, impairing the accessibility to large deprived communities. Higher education is becoming more and more stratified with less and less students for families with lower and lower middle income. Many of them belong to minorities. The increased certification is not just a socially undesirable side effect, but is more a silent social ticking bomb. Now, the need to preserve diversity of students has an additional and particular importance in medical schools. Racial and ethnic diversity with adequate representation of its diversity in society will result in improvement in quality of medical education, will increase the diversity of physicians and research workforce, 
The increasing facility of graduates will improve access to health care for deprived population and nourish and perpetuate research in medicine and particularly in public health. Diversity of medical students eventually will result in diversity among health care managers. Therefore, increasing tuition to compensate for the reduction in governmental funding seems to be a real problematic option, especially in immigrant absorbing culturally diversified countries such as Israel, and you have heard about the pending student strike from uh, Mr. Shohat three days ago. Again, you have to remember the laws the American students are getting. Therefore, public universities in Israel have become more reliant on other funding resources Universities have jumbled to sustain excess and quality for, by diversif diversifying revenues, streamlining cost, and adopting technology. More emphasis is being made and put on research grants and alliance with business. Universities are discussing joint ventures with partners from the private sectors and research contracts are made within industrial, high technology, and pharmaceutical companies. Medical schools have demonstrated enormous creativity. And some have broadened their revenue based on launching new academic programs, nursing programs, etc. In that respect, programs for foreign medical students were considered to be an appealing track to increase revenues. We present this alternative to maintain financial resources of public institution by engaging a private program for foreign students within it. This hybrid system is running at the Faculty of Medicine in which parallel to the public Israeli medical program, a private medical program for American students, USA and Canadians. This hybrid system, however, is not free from potential obstacles and conflicts. First, students might get the false feeling their title or achievements can be bought and therefore are negotiable. Students who pay more expect to be rewarded accordingly. The background level of academic achievements between the two programs may differ. The socioeconomic status will differ between the two groups of students. The private program will lack the diversity that I mentioned before, and there might be hostility between the two different group of students in the two programs. And finally, faculty members may prefer to teach in the private program if they will be personally rewarded. Now, in order to solve this problem, we decided on several principles. First, only good and motivated students will be recruited to the program so they will understand the paying is not enough. Student obligation and privilege, they should know from the start, are the same in the two programs. When they are accepting the Technion, they are under the obligation and privilege of any other Technion students. The academic program is based on private program faculty members as part of their duties. They are not rewarded on a personal basis. Same high standard of teaching in both programs is applied, and the same criteria are used for failure, success, moving to the clinical use, and excellence in both programs. We had a, a dying program that was running for, for 20 years, and then at the time of uh, Professor uh, Prevet Slavi, who was sitting in the, between the audience, uh, we decided to uh, revive it, and um, we established a new program, which we call the TEAMS program, the Technical American Medical Student Program. Academic Steering Committee was nominated, and the Steering Committee was added by Professor Avram Ershko, Nobel laureate. The courses were designed in accordance with the best U.S. universities. We were sitting on their program, trying to see what can we do here in the Technion. The program was designed to fulfill requirements of all states, and in the United States of America, there are different requirements between different states. Um, I won't go into details. We had to give them the appropriate time 
for the United States medical license examination, electives, and finally for the resi residency matching program. So the program was designed in time frame that will allow them to do that. Then we add some technical flavor. We had some courses like research method, imaging from bench to bedside, technology development, and we opened an MD PhD program in this uh, private program. We signed mutual agreement between the Technion and leading U.S. universities. Some of them are mentioned here. The agreements were giving the chance for those students to go back and to do their 12 weeks of electives in department in the hospitals belongs to these universities. In order to be eligible to the program, the student should be United States or Canadian citizenship, or it could be a permanent residence in this country. Uh, this uh, point was raised. We wanted to uh, eliminate the phenomena that rich young boys from Israel will go study in American college and then come back to Israel. That was the Technion uh, idea. The student should finish one year of course, obligatory course, with laboratory in general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and general biology. Those are the pre-med courses that are needed to be, <coughs> to be part in the medical school. We designed that we will not accept everyone. We will settle a threshold in the MCAT, in the medical college admission test, in the biological and physical sciences, which will be above the average of the American students in the States. The GPA, the grade point average, should be above the average, and we will not accept students with Cs. After excluding those who are not eligible, we interviewed the students, uh, looking, excluding students from, because of psychological problems and assessing the overall fitting of the student to the program. By the way, while doing the interview, we have learned two things. First reason for choosing the program was the Technion reputation. Second thing that we have learned, that the main source for the information was the website. So we redesigned our website, and it's linked to the Technion main page and the faculty main page. We distributed brochures, and we employed uh, faculty member, professor of psychiatry from Brown University, who is our representative and recruiter in the States. In the first year was 2006 for the new program. There were 123 applicants. Out of them, 76 we found eligible to the program, mainly because of academic uh, fitness. Out of them, 32 were accepted and started the program. By the way, the rate between female and male is still in advance for males, which is different in the public program. If you look at the states, Canada is not a state of the United States, of course, but most of them are finishing in three minutes. To those Canadians who are here, uh, the Canadians are coming from Ontario, but, but we hope and believe this will recruit students from other uh, places in Canada. But you see the New York is still the big apple and the source for the students. Look at the colleges. Again, the Yeshiva University, which is in New York, is of course the main source for the students. However, you can see students coming from uh, first league colleges in UCLA, UPenn, and others, McGill in uh, Canada, etc. Looking at their scores in their college, you, oh, sorry. you see the 90% 90, 90 of them are having B and more, no Cs. The average MCAT score was 9.55, and the average M uh, GPA is 3.6. If you want to compare it to other universities, we still cannot compete John Hopkins and Harvard. However, our students MCAT and GPA scores are 
The same is in Boston, and even better than the state universities of uh, Wayne State and uh, Michigan State. Now, what about economics? A little bit about it, and then I'm finishing. Uh, with the full program, the income will be two million eight thousand twenty thousand American dollar. Fifty-eight of it will go to expenses for slots for faculty members, preclinical and clinical faculty members that teach in both programs, in the Israeli and in the American program. The revenue is shared with the Technion, so the faculty will get the 21%, which cover 34% of the faculty day-to-day -day expenses. So we believe that uh, a solid and good private program cannot only close the gap between the budget and the expenses, but the revenues that will come will enable funding of better teaching conditions and expanding number of preclinical scientists and academic physicians serving for both programs. And this is our main problem today with the Israel program. We don't have the slots for neither preclinical or physician. And I want to finish and to thank those who helped me to collect the data. Elad Ben Chaim, she is the team's executive secretary, and Mrs. Nat Erez, the faculty head of administration. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to call our, upon our discussant, Dr. Meir Zadok, who is the director of the Israeli Academy of Sciences and Humanities. And it's dealing with the issues that we are concerned. The joke is about two beggars sitting in front of a church. And uh, of course, they are trying to raise funds and money. And in order to do so, one of them has a cross behind him with Jesus, and the other has, believe it or not, a Magen David. So people are going and passing by. Um, and some, of course, give money to the one with the cross, and it goes on for a number of hours. Then a priest comes, and you see those two beggars sitting there in the front of the church, and it's kind of uh, irritating to see the two of them and one with the Magen David. So he approaches the one with the Magen David and says, I think you are in the wrong place. What are you doing here? Um, he said, look, well, you know, Jesus was Jew, and uh, there are merciful people, and my, I might get some uh, donations. Uh, so I'm sitting here, and the priest, uh, in fact, tells him, look, I think you are uh, helping your friend to get more fun, more money. He said, well, you know, still, this is what, what I'm trying, and uh, it works. When the priest goes to the church, one of the beggars, the one with the Magen David, uh, says in Yiddish to his colleague, look, this priest is trying to teach us surviving uh, and uh, uh, marketing in survival. So actually what we are trying to do is for the last, I think, 30 years or so, and I'm in the, this business from 72, we're trying to survive. The, the higher education system is trying constantly to find resources from, uh, various, uh, from various foundations and, of course, the, uh, the, main thing, the main source has been so far the government. Um, what actually uh, is common and I think is uh, uh, the common feature between Shoshana uh, Arad didn't give her lecture about the College uh, of Rupin and of course we saw a number of cases here um, dealing with various uh, imaginative and creative ways of trying to raise funds to higher education. And the recent one, of, co of course, uh, was uh, in the medicine uh, uh, at the Technion. There was an early one, I think 30 years ago, at the Tel Aviv University, 
there were and there still are all sorts of uh, efforts of uh, trying solutions. I think that the umbrella that's connect all the fields together, and this is something that I've been trying to find out what is the common do the dominator uh, about all the processes that we see. And I'm trying to divide it to th three categories. The first one, the main thing is diversification. And uh, well, I moved from uh, the Ministry of Absorption in 72 when Igal Alon moved from the Ministry of Absorption to become the Minister of Education. And actually I was since then uh, the early stages of building the Planning and Grants Committee and later the Israel Science Foundation and later the Council of, uh, for R&D and so on. Actually, practically I've been in the effort of trying to create some changes within the existing system and of course with difficulties. One thing is that I think three categories that I think we, uh, I tried to find out. First, the mission. There's no doubt that the mission of the founding father of the State of Israel uh, dealing with higher education was research oriented and our guests who uh, kept coming for the last, I think, 15 years know about the Humboldtian model and probably some of them say that the last place where the Humboldtian model is still uh, active is in Israel. Uh, the, the mission has changed. There's no doubt the mission has changed. Uh, since we are talking about medicine, I'll never forget there was a, dis a discussion at the Council of Higher Education, I think in 72, when Nigal Alon presented his idea to have a new faculty of medicine at Be'er Sheva University, and without his voice, it wouldn't have passed at the Council. So there was no doubt the politician in this sense were a driving factor uh, for change. One thing is in the diversification of missions, what happened in the last, I think, 30 years or so, reluctantly, I must admit, reluctantly by the establishment, and I can't name the people, but the establishment of uh, higher education, first to accept the colleges uh, as existing, and then later to see uh, changes in what is called the private colleges. And we saw all the, uh, all the examples that were uh, brought up to, to this discussion. So first, diversification of mission. This is the first category. And diversification of the mission certainly uh, sometimes was done by uh, people with drive, sometimes by uh, politicians, but the diversification of mission was certainly a hard thing to go through uh, in, in our situation. I must admit that I saw yesterday Hartmann talking and today Professor Reichman and uh, Tzvi Arad, the drive of people is unbelievable. Certainly they deserve all the credit to know that they at least have something to accomplish within the existing system. For years, I think the changes started to take place sometime when Amnon Pazia was appointed as the chairman of the, of the University Grants Committee. Then the first changes in the mission of uh, higher education and the colleges opened up. The whole process of uh, having new colleges, uh, uh, the doors were open to the new colleges and to new, structure, uh, new structures. Uh, there is also change in the structures. So what we realize in the last 30 years, change in mission, and the change in mission has occurred maybe at not not same pace that we wanted, but certainly it occurred in, in, uh, in the Israeli uh, universities and the change of structures. Uh, first, whether we like it or not, the Planning and Grants Committee was certainly a change in the structures. I, I remember days where the negotiation were directly with the Treasury, and we don't want to go back to it. Certainly we don't want. And uh, when Tamara Riaf talked here, I think, um, people have no idea. I mean, I've, only the Ministry of uh, Science, Minister of Science for the last uh, 10 years or so, 16 Ministers of Science. Who wants to go through this? Who wants to have changes in the political system to the extent that uh, we, the, the, within the scientific uh, community, and I will use a phrase that Simcha Soroke once used it, uh, the Planning and Grants Committee, he said something like, and you know, he was also in 
the director of the budget of the treasury, among other things that he did, he said we, uh, meant the government, gave you the key to the cashier and you are now running it alone. Practically, this was uh, at the early stages, certainly. Anyone who followed what happened later will certainly realize that the block grant principle that was based in the whole belief of what is block grant principle has eroded completely and there is a contract between the Treasury and the Planning and Grants Committee which I think is a complete intervention of the state. Uh, number of students, cost of student, direction and so on. But on the whole there was a change in the structure, change in the uh, membership of uh, the Council of Higher Education and change within universities. Maybe again, it wasn't at the, pace, the same pace that was expected, but there was a change within universities and also change with uh, uh, other entities that uh, started to come up, among them the Israel Science Foundation. This was again a change that took place by the initiation of, uh, of uh, the academia, uh, not just the institution, but uh, was not a decision of the government. Uh, then there was a change in the funding sources. Uh, the table that uh, Hagit showed last, uh, last night, 60% uh, is coming from public sources and the rest you have to raise from other sources, tuition fees and other sources. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the, I remember the figures when I'm talking about the early 70s, the figures were the government supported then something between 70 and 80 percent. It depends what year. We are now short of in terms of uh, 60 percent, and it's not just 60 percent, but also in absolute terms, it's uh, when you talk about one point uh, half billion dollars in absolute terms, it's a lot of money. I would like to relate to the issue of cost. Uh, uh, Gabi Motskin. Uh, wrote, I think, a wonderful appendix, and of course this, uh, the, the talk that he gave, but the first time that I came across his uh, way of thinking was when we appointed at the Academy a committee to deal with the state of, uh, of uh, humanities. And there is appendix, I suggest that you see it, it was published. Uh, the appendix was written by Gabi Motskin relating to the whole budgeting model of the uh, Planning and Grants Committee, which I think is an excellent piece, and certainly uh, we, we see it here. Uh, I would like to relate what cost has been. This book was published by the Carnegie Committee, and Howard Bowen was the leading economist during the 70s and the 80s, and I think it's true. Uh, no figures, don't worry. Uh, what he actually says, uh, a number of what he calls the laws of uh, higher education, um, and I'm just quoting from his book, which was published in 1981. Institutions tend, therefore, to spend up to the very limit of their means. This is an observation of uh, many institutions that they had to work uh, on the Carnegie Commission. The other law that he said, each, uh, each institution raises all the money it can. Very trivial. Each institution spends all it raises. And five, the cumulative effect of the preceding four laws is toward ever-increasing expenditure. So uh, anyone who dealt with the issue of cost will certainly find out and the model of budgeting that uh, Vatat has been using for years was based on something very simple. It's a contract between three institutions, the Planning and Grants Committee, the government, and the universities. And the contract is based on the belief and trust once you break the contract, you don't accept the cost uh, at a certain point, you actually lose the whole base of the interaction. So what happened in recent years, uh, the model has been more detailed and the relation of cost to reality uh, has completely eroded. Um, but one thing about the budget, that, uh, the model budget that we are using, and I think we should s try to see, especially these days, <coughs> Uh, positive points in the things that have been done in recent years. This is the only public sector in Israel that is using output budgeting. Anyone who knows what it means understands the complexity of trying to find 
all sorts of indicators, not input indicator, output indicator, that are connected to students' efficiency, research quality, and, uh, and, and, and the quality of uh, students. This has been in one model dealing with the output. And there's no other public sector in the whole country that has been doing it for the last 30 years. I think it should be kept. I think it is something that we should treasure. Personally, it took me at least 10 years to work on it uh, between periods. And uh, it's connected to two people who are sitting here. Oded Messer was charged, Oded is Chagit's father, was charged during the period of Yigal alone to uh, find out what is the cost of student. And uh, I think when we worked at the 70s, there was no figures and there were no uh, accredited uh, numbers of, of expenditure. Uh, later, we were trying to deal with the model, and uh, I was looking for a student to help me collect the data, and unfortunately, I met Steve Stav. And I think so far, at least, uh, the, the, this community has been trying to work on expert knowledge, uh, try not to involve politicians in our own business, and think running the, the, the operation with itself. And I think we should keep it. We should try to, of course, uh, be accountable, and all the words that we hear in recent years, of course, apply on uh, our system. Last, I would like to thank uh, the group of people that uh, came for the last 15 years a number of times to Israel. And uh, it started with uh, Nehemiah Lev Zion when he was director of the Van Leer Institute. And uh, I hope the Van Leer now will also uh, join forces with Mossad Neyman and others to also investigate and try to have those kind of seminars and workshops on higher education because we, as the public sector, we are not doing it and we are not doing it enough. And uh, the first time that uh, this group of people, and they are sitting here and you can see them here, came in, I think, 94 or 95 when Nehemiah was director of the Van Leer. And, I, and when, then we were facing a problem of the colleges. And I'll never forget what uh, we were told then. Um, we were told then by this group, try to ease with regulation and let the market forces work. I don't know whether we listened to them, but I think it's worth, worthwhile uh, the, the summary of the first meeting. And the last time we, they were here three years ago when we discussed uh, the mass higher education, maybe the mess in higher education, but the mass in higher education. And I think we should uh, thank them. We should try to maintain this kind of dialogue constantly. We need external people to have a look at the system who know and have the knowledge of, uh, of what's going on here. Unfortunately, the same group of people that I see here, this is what uh, Martin Tor used to call students of higher education, uh, we don't manage to add more people who are interested in this as a profession, and uh, rarely we have also presidents of uh, universities who uh, attend the meeting. But I think the dialogue should continue. It is essential. Uh, we should have, uh, we should be visible. Uh, we should try to open our discussions to others, not just this uh, small group. Thank you. going to open the session with questions and answers, but first, I, I understand there is a student in the audience who asked, to, who requested the possibility of asking a question. I give you the priority. You are not a student? Okay, go ahead. Speak into the... Push the button. <laughs> I'm responsible for the microphone, so I know how to. Okay, so uh, I think it's very important to hear something that someone from a side wants to, to say and thinks, because this conference likes uh, th those opinions. All you think is uh, about, uh, well, it's, all of this is your point of view. You forget the people that live the life in the free market. Uh, I think you're part of uh, the educational sector and uh, you give two products you give uh, research and you give education which is a very important service and I got a feeling that some of you forgets that uh, 
education is uh, actually your primary uh, role. This is what you. What, this is what people expect from you to give. Uh, you're talking about problems with uh, uh, the government. You depend on what the government uh, have uh, its policies, and uh, uh, eventually, government is to represent what people think, what people in all uh, the country think. So maybe the problem is not the government problem comes from how you uh, fulfill what you're, uh, what you're supposed to give. Maybe the problem is that uh, you lack in giving education. Okay? Uh, I, I was uh, thinking about privatization. I think it's only one thing to uh, consider when you try to help yourself. And I think it's a short-term solution because uh, you have to ask yourself, uh, would it really help you to uh, well, okay I, I try to make it short but what is the question? the question is, it, it's not a question actually, I want to suggest you uh, I want to suggest you to think about all those people that uh, live in the free market and uh, those who create the public opinion that uh, in the future is being represented by the government who allocates you the money and the budgets and uh, you, you think about what's happening now and uh, you don't think about what's going to happen next. Yesterday someone said that politicians are here for like four years or something and uh, Technion and other universities are eternal for, for good. Yes, so you have to think about the uh, solutions that, that are far from, uh, from now. I believe that uh, there is a serious problem in education here because you deal with research and education and uh, you have a serious problem to, co to combine between the two. In order to succeed, you have to separate these things. I understand that the idea is to give the students better I, education. I should have to interrupt you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Professor Motkin, would you feel this? Yes. Uh, look, in 1914, 3% of the people who were in the population age cohort were able to attend German universities. Today we're talking about cohorts of between 40 to 60%. That changes the nature of higher education from the beginning. Now, what's the problem with under-funded, uh, state-supported mass education? The problem is, while it's comfortable for the students to live for a few years in that situation, at the end, they have no marketable skills. That's what happens in a country like France, with a very high proportion of people who study at what are largely mediocre universities. I fear to offend somebody, but so it is. The best students go to Grands Ecoles and have a completely other track. Now, if it's a great question that you ask, should teaching and research be separate? After all, the original French model as the Russian model was to separate the two. Now, the question is, if they're separated, how do you want to do it? Which should be privatized, the research or the education? Uriel Reichmann seemed to indicate that he thought public money should still be research and, you know, education would have a more privatized function. But I could think it the other way just to say that education would be public, but research would be privatized. It's a question of what our social priorities are. Now I want to say something as a humanist. I fully accept, as a member of the humanities, that in the state of Israel we have no choice but to privilege technologically based sciences for survival. There's nothing we can do about that, much as I would like to have more people studying 16th century French literature, which I think is very important. Right. That, what I need to say is that we have to think beyond that of what we do with our marginal income over and above what we have. That means, however, for you, that in a society that is perched at the end of survival, research is as important as education. Now, the question is, to what degree are they synergistic? To what degree they, can they be separated? The discovery in Germany in the 19th century, where they were put together, was that it was cheaper to have them together. That does not hold true for all conditions. Thank you. Please. Loud. Uh, 
um, I said, instead of a joke, I wanted to uh, tell you a sad story. Back in 2001, I met with Nehemi Lev Zion, who was then the head of uh, Vatat, and uh, among other things, I wanted to see the formulas for how the Vatat uh, allocates the research uh, grant money, which is about one and a half billion shekels. And he told me, this is a secret. And uh, I was surprised, you know, how, how can it be a secret? Because if you want them to jump, you have to tell them whether to jump a high jump or a long jump. So uh, we agreed that after he secures the permission of the heads of the universities, he said that they even do not know how he allocates, uh, he will uh, let me have the formulas. And I got the formulas and I also got the numbers. And from the numbers, I immediately saw that there is an explosion of PhD students at certain universities. For example, Haifa University uh, increased its number of PhD students five folds in a matter of four years, uh, uh, coming to the level of the Technion. And it, it didn't make sense. And I, the, the, the reason was uh, the criteria that the uh, a trade uh, union imposed, which uh, called for showing of two PhD students as one of the criteria. And suddenly people uh, started to uh, uh, supervise PhD students, and the uh, academic level fell uh, 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 noticeably. This is one of the findings of the Shohat uh, Committee. Now, when I showed it at a conference, Ma'ariv uh, organized the conference in two, uh, uh, 2003, and the uh, Shlomo Gosman, who is now the head of Atat, was present, and also the uh, deputy of the Malag, uh, uh, deputy chair of the Malag, Echesker uh, Thaler, I showed the numbers, and I showed I mean, that the incentives are wrong. This is what uh, Gabi showed us also. And so Echesker Thaler uh, intervened from the audience and said the following. He said, we at the Malag know how to regulate to, to regulate without consulting the data. <laughs> he didn't care about the data. It's so English this show. is how this is how the Malag and Vatat are run. Thank you, Professor Schechter. Uh, uh, just a couple of uh, observations. You know, when you plan a, 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 a conference of this sort, you never know. Uh, you know, but sometimes uh, reality and realization change the way you wanted things to happen. Uh, especially the way after you hear what people say and what the people from the audience. Uh, two observations. One of them uh, deals with uh, Professor Shalev's uh, 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 example of the, uh, of the medical school at, in Haifa and the running of a commercialized program within an institute of higher education, which is state-supported. Uh, su and I connected with a, another presentation that was given yesterday by Uri Kirsch from the Technion, a member of VATAT, who talked about the attempts of VATAT to regulate commercial programs within state-supported uh, institutions. And we noted how VATAT I use the term zigzag, and actually they zigzag, which have the kept changing their decisions and how to regulate these kind of programs. And here you can see a good example of how a responsible institution, at least the way I, I, I see from the presentation, uh, takes two programs. One of them is state subsidized, the other one is commercial, so called commercialized, and runs it in a very responsible way without even the regulator tell them. I don't know whether they do tell or don't tell, tell them how to run these other so-called commercialized presentations. What we try to do in this, this, in this conference, and I'm very glad that this is an outcome, one of the outcomes of this conference, is to dispel the notion, and this is where you, Gabi Motzkin, I think, fell into the trap, dispel the notion that commercialization is equal to privatization. 
privatization is one notion, by the way, it's not just privatization, but privatization with an S, because there are various forms of privatization, as we noted the other day. It's privatization in higher education. This session deals with commercialization of programs within the public institutions. And we can see that those two things can cohabit. Now, this does not mean, and I think that the plea of Tabar uh, Riyadh that left us, uh, the fashion plea, to preserve uh, some of the regulating uh, uh, work of Batat and Malag should not be thrown out because they don't do the regula regulator's job uh, uh, appropriately. I think that uh, it does mean, of course, and Mayor, you are suggest I mean, we should, there should be a change. The change will not take place immediately, but certainly there are some ways in which Batat should change its regulation and take into account that what Professor Nibon, I think, referred to as accountability does exist even within state-supported uh, institutions that use public monies to carry out the, the, the mission. Now, to you, Gabi, I, I don't know, it was hard to follow your reading of, the, of, the, of, 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 of your presentation, and I will not go into discussion. This is not a place to deal with, uh, to, 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 to quarrel with you about how you uh, uh, interpret what economics is all about. But just a, a notion about the budgeting of the higher education system. Let's remember, and this is still in effect. Guru Zilka, I think, will, will support my point. When the budgeting of the various disciplines within the state-supported institutions was determined, when, when was it, Mayor? I don't know. You said that you, you did it with Odette Messer at that time. The humanities were allocated a much higher subsidy, what we call shipui in the Hebrew, per student by Vatat, not because of economic rationality, but, but because of economic realities. And this means that even when you have a body like Vatat, which apparently uses some economic, uh, apparently tried to use some economic rationality in allocating resources, it does take into account the importance of areas like the humanities and does not create a kind of a rule which you, uh, I think, uh, at least accused the system of doing by using just economic, straight economic, so-called economic rationality. It's not, even, even within this system, you take into account these uh, other aspects of, 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 of a higher education system, which of course does, should not be run just on economic grounds. I have to answer that. Okay, first of all, to you, I want to say In one cable thing. form, please. What, I want to say one thing very quickly. I don't criticize the Malag Vatat model for being uh, completely bad. I think it's a good model. I think it's not imaginative enough. And, that's, and I want to make it very clear and why, and why that is. Secondly, commercialization in state programs as opposed to privatization. I'm not against commercialization. I would be delighted to commercialize the humanities. In the, and I think I would do very well commercializing the humanities, and I can show that through all kinds of extra university programs. The university prevents me from private fundraising or commercialization. So I don't see that we have any quarrel on this at all. Now as to the question of the Vatat model, you know, we went through this. The Vatat model, I, I'm not going to get into the question of how credit points are allocated over three years. I wrote an analysis of this and what its consequences are for the humanities, the three-year completion rule, the differential uh, credit points for different faculties, how these, all, these evaluations were done. I can tell you the effects were devastating for the humanities. And they were devastating in the worst way. Now you can say maybe that's because the humanities were too fat, but the humanities were too fat according to the pricing model. I could have invented, and I did, many other pricing models just on a piece of paper that would have had exactly opposite results. It's all a question of what you choose to have as measures. There's no neutral set of measures. That's all I was saying. Thank you. Professor Reichmann. Uh, the, the very term of the conference of privatization is misleading. Uh, nobody is speaking about privatization as we uh, regard it in the private sector, in the uh, public private sector. Nobody is speaking about uh, taking out an uh, academic institution and making it for profit. So privatization, I don't think, is the right, uh, right term. Insofar as uh, what you termed commercialization within a university, uh, 
There is a great difference between having uh, foreign students coming in and uh, letting them pay the price, which is fine with me. Uh, where I have a problem is at um, when you take out certain programs from a public university and you charge extra money. Um, here we have a problem. Because you are using public funds, um, because the teachers are publicly paid, the, the infrastructure is publicly paid, and so on and so forth, and you charge the public um, a, an extra higher price um, at the time that you are supposed to, to serve the public interest and charge only a certain price. It is entirely different if a whole sphere, and that is my suggestion, a whole sphere is taken out of public funding. Let's say, and we proved it is possible, and Professor Motzkin is saying that it's also possible in the humanities, and so on. Let's take out, let's take out the law faculty, let's take out the business faculty, let's take out um, the social sciences, and take them out, not of the university system, but uh, out of public funding. They should be under the supervision of the university, but let's take them out in total. And then it is fair to, to let them charge the prices. And I believe that that should be the, the, the approach that I advocate, step by step, taking out entire faculties, entire departments out of the um, public uh, support system, let, let them operate in the market. We already created uh, that sphere. Let come, let compete fairly, I'm, I'm for it. But don't, don't, don't mislead, don't, don't take public money to finance, uh, to finance a, a faculty and, uh, and then have one or two or three programs um, and charge uh, market money uh, when you are funded and the funding is, um, is uh, related to the, to the cost of tuition that is prescribed by, uh, by the state. So commercialization, I'm all for it in the public sector, but do it um, fairly, openly, and for entire faculties um, uh, at all. But if you do, what uh, here is advocated that, let's say, a special program of Tel Aviv University is uh, under the banner of a public university uh, to take a program and charge, uh, charge, uh, charge differently, then, of course, the so-called private institutions will come up, as we will do, and we say, well, hey, it's unfair. Um, we would tell you what we want to, to operate in the market, free market, and what we would like that you subsidize us. And uh, that shouldn't be, shouldn't be allowed in my view. Please. Why is you it unfair? You are on the list. You are raising a very important question. We have two possibilities. Either accept, because we don't have enough funds, to have everything. So we have to make some decisions. The decision is, Will we allow public universities to get some money through private programs? And we will also allow private institutions like yours also to exist? Or we won't allow them at all to have them private and you are forcing them to go to a solution that I have no proof that it is optimal. I can show you from a very simple model that this, this, what is happening today in a way that nobody decided about it. Universities started because they were just starving. Maybe this is optimal and the solution that is done by the market is optimal and the one that you present might be less optimal for the whole economy. This could very well be. Uh, please. Your turn. I think it's worth uh, returning to the issue that our, uh, our student uh, at the aid raised because uh, uh, what, what I heard there was what uh, I hear from the U.S. public, uh, what I hear from uh, legislators in the U.S. 
and I suspect that one would also hear from uh, many legislators uh, in Israel, uh, namely that the, uh, uh, the job of, uh, the, of university faculty uh, is to teach and that anything else is, is separate or, or secondary. Uh, and, and, and we have to understand that that, that is a climate, a, a, an opinion climate, uh, in, which we, in which we operate. Uh, and we don't do a very effective job of responding to it uh, in general. Uh, I, th I, I reject that notion totally, uh, at least as far as the sciences and, uh, the, and engineering are concerned. Uh, I contend that it is impossible to have a first-rate educational program unless it's fully integrated with a, uh, with a program of scholarship uh, uh, and research. I can't speak for the humanities, but certainly in science and engineering, this is absolutely essential. Uh, sorry? Well, let me, let me, let me go on, because uh, that's, uh, that's what, uh, what makes life interesting. Uh, I, and I don't, and uh, Gabby Moskin suggested that the French model is different. Uh, but the, the modern French model, as I understand it, is not. Uh, research in France is concentrated in uh, CNRS laboratories, but every academic I know who does science or engineering in France also has an appointment in the CNRS laboratory, uh, and the research program and the, uh, the educational program uh, are run hand in hand. Uh, just... Okay. Uh, Okay, I, I, just three small uh, comments. One, I agree with, the, with your comments, but uh, to male sitting beside me, uh, you used Igal Alon's story to defend the politicians. However, Igal Alon was in politics, he was not a politician. And today, all our politicians are politicians, and that's the problem. Uh, regarding the... They are the, not Igal Alon. Right, and not Israel Rabin, unfortunately. Uh, Regarding your command, the zigzagging of Vatat is because they understand that we are more than starving. You cannot run today medical faculty without the addition of this budget. And the Israel, faculty, the Israel program will not be able to run unless we have this part of the money. Thank you. Dr. Professor Zaslavsky, uh, uh, I've read the book written by one who used to be the president of the University of California. And he says that the, the higher education in the United States looks like a carriage, wooden carriage pulled by a couple of oxes. And it is time, he says in the later pages, it is time that we'll start teaching and not, uh, and not uh, 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 differentiating or measuring. 90%, if not more, of the students that come to the Technion. And we have high, high passing grade and we have a very good population of students. Most of them come to get a profession and, and, and giving them two years of basic science, of, of fundamental sciences, it's like taking a soldier to the military instead of teaching him how to use the rifle. First of all, he must learn two years of the defense theory of the Middle East. That's roughly what it is. The, the research program, the question that the student asked, is very well in point. Being a teacher for tens of years in the Technion and elsewhere, I'm telling you, it's most, the diet given to the students, in most cases, it's not for their stomach. They come to learn, and by the way, if you let the engineers teach the calculus and the chemistry and whatever necessary to understand the material that they are learning, and the same, is, the same thing is true with, with uh, medicine. They don't have to, to prove the general theories of something. They have to, to learn about the practical application of sciences at the level that they need to understand what they have to do. And then a certain proportion will go up. Research is going to be given to this proportion which makes, I don't know, maybe up to 15% of mo mostly up to 
15% of the population of the students that come to the university. And then I must tell a story. No, we will have to, we will have to forego the yeah, story. He, uh, he told We're, a joke, I want to tell another no, no joke. No more jokes, I'm sorry. If I may. I'm sorry, no. That's, uh, you, that's I would like to ask Professor <laughs> Tadmor. Don't tell me the joke afterwards. <laughs> tell me afterwards the joke. You're, you're, you're the dear friend, Dan, but... I yeah, join the joke. him, I join him too. Dan, you're a dear friend, but how do you explain that if the diet is so wrong that the Technion is giving to the students? How do you explain that, that the Israeli high-tech industry, which is a leading industry in the world, is mostly from graduates of this university? who get that wrong diet of calculus and all that stuff. But this is a modern world, we are not in the last century. Well, we, we had the same argument 15 years ago in the Senate. When we submitted the report, Engineering Education 2001, and you objected to every recommendation, and I told you then, you want a, you want a, a curriculum which is not 2001, but 1901. And the world went ahead, and the world needs a different uh, qualification. And, and the basics are very important because it's a science-based industry, and that's the way the world is. Okay, thank you, thank you. No, thank you. And most of them almost... No failed. more, thank you. What, what we did, what we did is we, after the battle with chemistry... Done. We, ex we received... Done. What? With the joke, later. What? Okay, with the joke good. later, please. The joke. I'm going to get Mr. Stav of the Vatat Malak that has been maligned all morning. I'm going to give him a chance to say something, but you are the, the penultimate. Okay, uh, one comment. I think we, uh, education systems like you mentioned, we used to be called professional engineers in this country, and they, done, they, they, enable, they prepare you for the marketplace the day you're out, but actually the day you're out, you're already obsolete if you don't have any of the foundations and the ability to learn over time. Thank but I you. wanted to comment about uh, Professor Reichmann's uh, uh, point, if you, uh, if you insist on commercializing whole faculties or whole uh, disciplines, that would mean that, for instance, uh, there would not, it would not be possible to study law or business and pay the regular today's tuition, and notwithstanding what you said about the social responsibility of your institute, yesterday we saw figures that showed that if we were to rely only on the non-budgetary uh, uh, institutions, accessibility of higher education would be uh, greatly impaired. We saw numbers that Stephen Staff uh, presented, and since he will be talking in the next, he can either corroborate or otherwise. Stephen, in a few words, please. Okay, I'll try to shorten. One sentence. But not the last. Please. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, as we saw yesterday, also Professor Reichmann, you were unfortunately not able to attend here, but uh, we showed the important uh, participation of the private sector in the overall higher education system. It's a very important role which the uh, private uh, sector in the higher education system plays because of limitations which are overall governmental uh, limitations in the budgets and uh, also the market can cater for some of these uh, demands. So uh, these important roles are uh, the ones that the private uh, sector takes and uh, uh, we think it's complementary to the budgeted or public sector. I think the comments relating to over-regulation are correct. We have to see how we manage to open the market as much as we can, but still while maintaining our responsibility for seeking quality, 
excellence and to see that uh, uh, all the other institutions would be close or similar to the one that you uh, manage and we don't see this is the case and probably in future uh, also we have to even put uh, more emphasis on that. But on a general and broader uh, point, I'd like to note that the Malag and Fatah were formed, as we all know, by Allah way back in 1958, and perhaps then the politicians were more clever. And the 1977 governmental, uh, government resolution of forming Fatah was to give government authority and responsibility then within the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Education to Fatah. Today we have within the Malag, which is the Council of Higher Education, we have two-thirds of the 26 members coming from the institutions of higher education, both from colleges, universities, private and public colleges. So we have representation from them all. In Fatah, five out of the seven members are also representatives of the institutions of higher education. So this is, a, is also a system where these uh, appointments are uh, in term, term appointments. So we have people revolving. So this means this is a self-governing system that we all collectively have a stake in. So we have our own governance system, which I think is the best system that uh, we can find right now, because other countries also debating the same problems have reached much lesser, much lesser uh, uh, gains and, uh, and uh, like, like in research and in other areas uh, as, as we did, at a cost which is much less. So this means we must be doing something well. Also the administration, uh, which we have is probably also too big, but it's about a third of the size in relative proportion to that in England and Ireland and some other countries. It's only one third the size. So just to sum up, uh, we don't want to have the government, as other people said and also some others too, uh, manage the higher education system and then we are back to systems like the healthcare system, maybe the education system with the problems or the interior system with towns and cities run by government, uh, government appointees, we don't want that. So this self-governing system is a system that we can have influence over our own lives within the freedom that we want for academia, research, and we should improve as much as we can. So speak to those that are members, both in Patat and Malag, with all your recommendations, and the model, by the way, uh, Jakob Bergman, is published in the uh, Batat report. It's open, all universities and the members all know, I'm not answering you. Thank you, Steve. Okay, thank you very much yeah, also. Thank you. I'm coming to what you just said, and I'd quote Herzl. I want to respond to something that said. I, I, Okay, I would like to respond very quickly to two remarks that I thought were directed. One is about the French model. I was talking historically, the question of the Université de France in the 19th century and then of the SNRS as it was set up uh, in the 20th century. I'm sure there are movements there, but, however, I would still maintain in most universities in France you do not get a good undergraduate education. Now to you. Uh, yes, I would all be for separation, except that some public programs are underfunded by the model. Now what I was suggesting is what you have to see is that in certain areas, you can say, for instance, I will fund half the humanities, or you could have a model by which I'll say, I'll make a $10 million and I'll rebate to the taxpayer a certain proportion of my state funding. There are many ways to slice that cake. Our biggest problem is that in the last 50 years, research has expanded so that the balance between research and teaching, as we all know, has been changed. Think of the German model. It expanded under the fact that professors were paid differentially for how many students they had in their lectures. I can show that for Heidegger in 1929 where he writes letters. I have 400 people in my course, therefore I require 30 more percent to addition. Thank you. Okay. 